Don't write down this schematic until I'm done, because I'm going to modify it. I'm going to build up a cascaded counter. simplify the schematic. I'm going to leave out a lot of the details because we're all familiar with how to use these 160 series of counters and create a cascading counter. Okay, I'm going to put another one in here. So this is how I would build up my counter. And we're going to assume that these are all driving the display. Say that this is uh, counting ones, tens, hundreds, and I'm going to continue this on. So these are coming off the production line. They're part of a product that your company's building. And you've hired a test technician to test these. And as part of the test, they have to verify that every possible count value will appear in the seven second displays. How many clocks is it going to take to do that? I think 10,000. How many? 10,000. No, that, that last one's 10 Ks. It's going to take uh, 100,000, right? Because what's the maximum number? 99,999. So it's 100,000 clocks. Let's assume that uh, your test technician can verify numbers at a one second rate. So to test this circuit would require 100,000 seconds. Bearing in mind that there are 3,600 seconds in an hour, it's going to take days to do that. Design for test. I'm going to modify the design 
not to satisfy some operational specification, some performance spec, but strictly for testing. I'm going to make a modification to this circuit that will allow me to achieve that test in 10 seconds. Here's what I'm going to do. Oh, Greenwood, before you begin, um, will this affect this drawing or will this be a separate drawing? What do you mean a separate thing? Or a separate schematic? Oh, I'm going to modify this schematic. Okay, thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, in between the chips, I'm going to put a multiplex. This will go <coughs> into the zero input. One input I'm going to hook to BCC. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing here. And I'll do the same thing here. select input here uh, I'm going to pull that out and they're all going to be tied together so and this will be Let's call this input mode. So uh, mode will be a logic zero or a logic one. If mode is a logic zero, I'm going to be selecting the zero input on all those multiplexers. And if I have mode equal to one, VCC is going to be applied to the ENTs. I'll select the one input. Okay. All right. Let's take the case first where mode equals zero. So the zero input is what's going to drive the output of the multiplexers. So ripple carry out goes to ENT, ripple carry out goes to ENT, and so on, all the way down the line. And that's the normal operation of the counter. But what happens when I put the mode input to a logic one? I'm hooking VCC up to ENT on all of the counters, which satisfies the enable condition. Now 10 clocks will indicate whether that uh, display shows zero through nine. It takes 10 clocks to verify the circuit works. 10 seconds. Does everybody see that? Mm, I think I want to open all the way through. So you don't have to run through all 10,000 possible combinations. You just got to show that every single Why do I have to? You just have to show every display goes from 0 to 9. Yeah, I, I'll verify that each one of these counters will output 0 through 9. I, I think the 160 is a decade counter. Mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Instead, as opposed to the binary counter. Um, so you can verify that each one of these counter chips will output a zero and the zero will be correctly displayed. 
and the one and the two all the way up to nine. It takes 10 clocks to verify the circuit designed for test. Now, this brings up a very, very important concept to implement design for test. Design for test Must be considered at the beginning of the design effort. Tell me why. It's part of the very fabric of the circuit. It's part of the what? The very fabric of the circuit. It's built into it. So it's something to consider. So what does that affect? Components, cost, durability. Quality insurance. The circuit's going to be built on a printed circuit board. So if you lay out, so if you consider design for test at the end, and let's take this as an example, you lay out your printed circuit board for the cascading counter without the multiplexers. How do you now add, after the fact, the multiplexers? It needs to be considered from the very start. So if you're the design engineer, joined at the hip, so to speak, is your test engineer. And the test engineer will look at the design and say, you know, if we do this, this, and this, that'll really make this circuit a lot easier to test. And then, you negotiate things back and forth. Uh, obviously, if you're adding components, it's going to be a little bit bigger printed circuit board. Uh, so there's some trade-off here involved. Uh, but it's at the beginning of the design process where you decide you're going to do something like this to support tests. So design for tests must be considered at the beginning of the design process. Now. Because you guys all showed up and the other people didn't, it's going to be a little secret among us. I'm going to ask that on the final. Design for tests must be considered at the beginning of the design process. That will be one of the questions on the final. Don't tell anybody who wasn't here. The heck with it. Okay. So now, let's talk a little bit more about testing. And I've got a series of slides I'm going to be putting up. All of these are on Canvas. Um, what I want to do is to be able to test uh, an integrated circuit. So, which is implemented in, in a, we'll, we'll assume a single IC. And what we discussed before is, what I would typically do is input a set of test patterns and check my observed results with my expected results to see if there's any stuck at points. And conceptually, that's not too bad. Uh, but there's a couple of issues that we're going to have to deal with. 
so here's some inquiry circuit. I have no idea what the circuit does. That doesn't matter uh, for our purposes. Uh, there are six inputs labeled input one through input six, and two outputs, output one and output two. All right, so I need to start out by defining uh, a couple of terms. First definition, controllability. This is the ability to put any node in the circuit to a logic one or logic zero. Now, if the circuit was 100% controllable, then I would be able to pick any point within the circuit and be able to say, that point is now a logic one, I know that for certain. 100% controllability is rarely, if ever, achieved. And here's the reason why. Let's look at this particular circuit. If this circuit was controllable, I could put a logic one at that particular point, that G input. Now the problem that you're going to have to deal with is you have a limited number of inputs. I only have six inputs. Tell me what input I would apply, what test pattern would I apply that would make that point of logic one? It's not intuitively obvious what test pattern would do that for you, or what sequence of test inputs would do that for you. Uh, similarly, how would I make this point a logic zero, or that point a logic one. If my circuit was 100% controllable, I would have some method of doing that. So in practice, 100% controllability is not going to be achieved. And the limiting factor is about all you can do is you have a series of inputs. You may have presets and clears, but you have a limited number of inputs, and it may be a very complex circuit. And if all you have is the inputs to manipulate, it's not intuitively obvious how I would get some internal point in this circuit to a logic one or logic zero state. The other term to define is observability. And this is the ability to determine the logic state of any node. Uh, how do I know that value, because the limiting factor now is I only have two outputs. Now this output will tell me what the state is of that, and output one will tell me the state of that, but how do I determine the state of that? So the limited number of inputs limits uh, your controllability, and the limited number of outputs 
limit shore observability. So there's a technique that will not get you to 100% on these two, but greatly improve your controllability and observability, and that's known as scan testing. Okay, uh, let's look at a, a, a couple of things. And this next slide is very important. What I've done here is temporar temporarily removed all the registers. Now, you'll notice in any Q or Q bar, I'm going to bring out and form a test point input. So I've got one, two, three, four, five. So I have five test point inputs. Every D, and there's four of them, because there were four registers. The D input, I'm going to bring out and form a test point output, one through four. So the D's on the uh, inputs on these registers, each one will form a test point output. Each Q will provide a test point input. Okay. Now, what's the point of doing that? Well, let's look at what those test point inputs will do for me. Let's look at this block of logic right up here. What are the inputs to it now? Uh, well, the original data input, input two. Test point input one. Test point input two. Uh, and input five. So I now have a way of providing the four inputs to that block of logic, which would increase my controllability. Does everybody see that? Well, now I've got, I can apply test patterns here, and I've got test patterns to apply to the original inputs. I now have the capability of providing all of the inputs to this block of logic, which gives me controllability of that block of logic. Okay? And you can look at other portions of the circuit and see how the original data inputs in conjunction with these additional five test point inputs uh, improves my controllability of the circuit. Now I took the Ds uh, and I form test point output. So let's take this D right here, which is test point output two. If I apply a pattern to the data inputs in these test point inputs, this block of logic is going to produce an output. And that output will go to this D input but now that is tied to a test point output, so I can see what that block of logic did. So that would improve my observability. Okay. So everybody see how that works? So, by temporarily removing this, uh, having HQ and Q bar that was used in the registers forming that test point input, and each D for a register providing a test point output, I get enhanced controllability and observability. Of course, there's two problems here that we're going to have to deal with. First off, this is a relatively simple circuit. The circuit doesn't have two, com uh, 
have to be too much more complex, and you realize I've added a whole bunch of new pins to this integrated circuit. Uh, on this simple circuit, I added nine pins. The second issue, which is more onerous, is I've changed the functionality of the circuit. I took out the registers. So this obviously isn't a solution. If for nothing else, the second reason, I've changed the functionality. But um, it does illustrate how those registers, through their D inputs and the Q outputs, gives me a way of increasing the controllability and observability. So what I'm going to do now is put the registers back in. I'm going to take out those test point inputs and the test point outputs. But I'm going to replace the registers with a special type of register. And that special type of register is called a scan flip-flop. So this is what a scan flip-flop looks like. Uh, here's your standard D-type flip-flop. I might have a Q bar in there as well. But this is your basic Q uh, D flip-flop. And this is what the scan flip-flop looks like. Uh, and the only real difference is I'm going to put a multiplexer on the input that will drive the D input on this flip uh, I will have two possible inputs. Uh, the data input is the normal input that you would have for the circuit, the normal data input. Uh, the second input is going to be something called scan in, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. So there's two sources now to drive the D input. And then there's going to be the signal called scan enable, which is the select line for this multiplexer. So I can choose the scan in or the data input to drive the D input. Um, I'm also going to have a, a secondary output called scan out, but that's just equal to Q. This may be a separate output on this device, but internally, scan out equals Q. All right? So, this shows the circuit where I have replaced all of the internal registers with these scan flip-flops. And you'll notice I've removed the test point inputs and the test point outputs because they don't need those. Okay. I do need to add three pins to the integrated circuit. And these three pins are added regardless of the complexity of the circuit. This circuit could have 822 registers inside of it, or it could have two registers inside of it. I still only will add three pins. Those three pins are scan in, SE, scan enable, and scan out. So those are the three pins that you need to add to the chip. Everything else remains the same. Now, look at what we're doing here. The scan in pin goes to the scan data in. That would be the scan in input on the multiplexer. 
The scan data out from this chip gets hooked to the scan data in of the next register. The scan data out of that one goes to the scan data in of the next register. The scan data out goes to the scan data in of the last register. And the scan data out from the last register is what drives the scan out pin. Through this um, scan enable, I can determine whether the D input here is going to be driven by the scan data in or the normal data input. Now, um, it doesn't matter, incidentally, uh, which order that you connect these together. Uh, this one connected to this one, and this one, and this one. I could just as easily have done this one to this one to this one to this one to scan out. So the order really doesn't matter. Now, if you look at that green data path, what I have done is create a shift register. If I put the scan enable to choose the scan input on each one of these scan flip flops, SDI connected to SDO, the previous register, I can clock in a pattern into these registers. Okay. Now, why is that important? Well, we're going to modify something that we told you before. And this might be a little bit easier if uh, I put the previous uh, slide up, the original circuit. Okay, that's the original circuit. Now what we told you was We ask the question in this type of situation how many test patterns are required for an exhaustive test? How many Four. test patterns are there? Two to the end. Two to the end. It's not entirely true. That statement is true if and only if that logic block is combinational logic. If it's sequential logic, the number of test patterns required is going to be considerably large. Considerably large. Let's see why that is. I have six inputs. How many unique test patterns are there? 
64, 2 to the 6. So I apply a, a given test pattern and I get some output. I'm going to get the same output. Oh, uh, and this circuit uh, does have a clock. So I would apply a test pattern, give it a clock, and then go look at the outputs. Okay. Uh, pick any test pattern you want. All zeros, for example. I'm going to submit that you're not going to get the same output if these registers are 0, 0, 0, 0 before you apply the test pattern versus if the registers had 1, 0, 1, 0 and you applied that same test pattern. The output that you're going to get for a given input test pattern depends on what was the state of all of those registers prior to you applying the test pattern? So uh, let's let K equal the number of registers. So in this particular design, K is 4. How many unique output combinations are there? the registers. Sixteen. Sixteen. I have four registers. So looking at the registers I could have zero 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 one zero 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 one zero zero and so on. There's sixteen patterns. Which means to conduct the exhaustive test, I would have to apply each test pattern 16 times, each time with a different initialization of the registers. So the exhaustive test is not 2 to the, K, uh, 2 to the N, it is 2 to the N times 2 to the K, which equals to the n plus k, n being the number of bits input to the device, k being the number of registers. Your exhaustive test for a sequential circuit just blew up. If this circuit's got 20 registers in it, it's now 2 to the n plus 20 for an exhaustive test. Ooh. That can get real nasty really quickly. Okay, so that's what you're going to have to deal with. The question is, how do I initialize those registers for each test pattern? And we'll find out after five minutes break.